I'm going to talk a little bit. John did a great overview of um, the growth trends, uh, growth and trends. So in a way, given he uh, was billed as giving the best presentation of the day, this is a bit of a tough follow-up, but I'll do my best. Um, so the, the Cambridge Center for Alternative Finance is at the University of Cambridge. It's an initiative that the university put in place about a year ago, recognizing that fundamentally there's structural change going on in how finance is being provisioned. This isn't a cyclical thing. And that has a lot of implications around novel financial instruments and channels of finance that are emerging outside of the regulated capital markets and banking system. And what's interesting about that is, first, how they emerge from outside, not within the system, but they tend to go back into the system. And when they go back into the system, how do they go in? Do they change the system? Does the system change then? But this is how change is produced. So essentially, we have three core research themes. One, we look at online channels. So this is obviously uh, marketplace lending is a subset of that. I'll talk about in detail. Risk analytics, which has been raised today. Um, this is very intrusive, increasingly intrusive around machine learning, artificial intelligence, deep learning. Um, so we cooperate with groups like the Neuroscience Group at Cambridge and looking at where that's going. And the third is payment systems. Uh, there was a reference earlier to things like secondary markets and liquidity and this is, a, I think, an area which is going to have a great bearing on secondary markets in this space. So what we've done in the online channel space is produce three major reports. Um, in the UK market, certainly the largest report on online alternative finance that's ever been produced. So that's um, data from platforms over a million transactions, over a billion and a half dollars of volume. Um, we did a national consumer poll, 2,000 people, 15,000, 16,000 survey responses. Um, a lot of polling, a lot of interviewing, a lot of data from platforms at the UK level. I'll show a little bit of that data because it's some interesting insight. And then we did in February, uh, Brian Zhang and I co-wrote the European report which really looked at sizing and growth rates and the typology of how this is emerging across the 27 countries in Europe. Oops. So just in, in the simplest terms, you know, marketplace, let me just check, yeah. Marketplace lending today, if we look at this is our data of how we kind of broke it down in terms of the total online alternative finance, the crowdfunding world. You have about three quarters of the volume is financial in terms of what's happening online. Um, and about 61% would be in the lending space. Now what's interesting about this is that you see equity over on the far right side. Equity is 14%, but it's driving the regulatory agenda. And I think that's one of the interesting things we picked up, that the volumes, regulators have not picked up to the extent that I would have thought they would have, that the, the big, big action in this space is the lending volume. It's not the equity volume. But the perception of investor exposure is quite different. And so I'm going to talk about three trends that I think are influencing the development of markets, particularly outside the United States. I'm going to, first of all, walk through some descriptives about how this pattern uh, of growth is emerging, how it varies from the U.S. market. And I'd highlight that while the U.S. market is quite a bit bigger than the European market, um, and the U.K. dominates, overwhelmingly dominates volumes in Europe, uh, actually, on a GDP measured basis, the U.K. is bigger than the U.S. relative to GDP. Um, and I also think when I read reports about the industry, uh, you know, Chinese market sizes are quoted. Uh, the data is all over the place. You can find data that says it's anywhere from 10 billion to 40 billion, 50 billion. I had a group of Chinese bankers uh, I gave an alternative finance lecture to at Cambridge about two weeks ago, and I asked them, and I said, where is it in this space? And they just laughed. And they're in this space. So anytime you hear data about what's going on in China, just be careful. <laughs> I think the other opportunity for investors is that lending is absolutely accelerating outside of these main high profile markets. I'll talk a little bit about that towards the end. And I think that's a great, great um, diversification opportunity. If you look at correlations of, say, a Kenyan farmer you know, relative to a US SME, and I have a portfolio, um, portfolio correlations, I think, will become more of an issue in this space for investors over time. And the regulatory landscape's evolving. It's having an impact on growth patterns. 
Uh, I'll walk through that a little bit. It's very divergent at the national level, but there's some convergence at what we call the supranational or certainly within Europe uh, on the broader European level, which I think is going to be an important trend in time. And I think the platforms are adapting very rapidly to very specific individual market characteristics. I'll talk about a couple of those points. So just quickly looking at some of the numbers, you can see here just the overwhelming domination of the UK and the European market. So if you read Morgan Stanley's report in May, which was a pretty good report, right? It basically says, forget about the rest of Europe. Um, I think that's a missed opportunity, okay? So on a snapshot basis, yes, the UK looks like the place to be. It's also intensely competitive. Um, and you look at some of these other countries, and it, it, actually I, I would argue that they're growing faster and there's opportunities there, but you have to understand how to approach those markets in a different way. This is the GDP data that I mentioned earlier in the reference of the market sizing of the US relative to the UK market. Uh, the UK is about 35% higher, measured on a GDP basis. Again, the China question uh, all over the map, and I think what's interesting about China is that the banks are deeply involved in this space and have been really from the outset. So about 10% of volume in the Chinese market today, again, 10%, 15, 5, <laughs> but to call it 10, uh, is bank-owned platforms and a lot of cooperative activity between banks and platforms. Now we did some research on how platforms perceive the regulation, the regulatory environment in their country and I'm, I'm only going to point to to two countries. Look at Germany and Spain, right? So the dark bar at the bottom, right, is basically the regulation of my country is too strict, right? So actually what you see, look at the Netherlands, right? I mean, the Netherlands punches way above its weight, but you can see it in the volumes if I was to go back two slides. And what you see in Germany, um, you know, Germany, the, this is the home of the Mittelstadt. You know, this is 80 million people. This is the biggest GDP in Europe. And I'll tell you, in SME lending, I mean, just go back. Yeah, Germany, I mean, nowhere. Nowhere. So how long is that really going to last, right? What I'll say about regulators, there was a comment made earlier, I think by John, said, well, geez, you know, um, how, much information, how much information do we want to give regulators? Or, so there was a concern about regulators. You know, I've been, as I mentioned, the investment business for 30 years, and I've never seen a more benign regulatory environment for a new type of investment activity than I've seen right now in this space. If you sit down and you talk to the UK regulator, what you'll find is a very strong positive sentiment to not want to kill the innovation. There is still major anti-incumbent bank sentiment in every country of Europe. And this plays to the industry's advantage. So there's a way, and I think the UK platform's done an excellent job of engaging constructively with the government. And what we've seen is this sort of data, I'll tell you, I, I'm making a big difference in terms of informing policymakers. If policymakers don't have data, they either prohibit or they overregulate. And I've seen this mistake made in other industries that said, oh, no, 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 we can't, we, we, our data is our data, we compete on our data, we don't want to give away information. I'll tell you, in the medium term, it's a mistake. And just by way of example, Finland put out a, um, Ministry of Finance in Finland put out a consultation document to change legislation in Finland specifically because of our report data that showed that Finland was punching below its weight in volumes and on a per capita basis. And when they look at themselves, they say, yeah, but we're supposed to be this big innovative country, so we better look at this. It can move regulators. And if we take a look at, well, what is the approach across Europe? It, it's really three buckets, right? Um, we look at the green, arguably, you know, the regulator said, this is a new activity, and this deserves a new framework. So let's think about how we're going to do that. Now, it doesn't always come out well. In the UK, it came out very well. You know, in Germany, it's still pretty tough. One of the reasons is, you, you know, you've got to lend through a bank. You've got some complication. Or you do the stretch to fit. Again, Finland, well, you know, this is a new activity, but how do we kind of kludge or modify something to kind of squeeze it in? Or the third is, well, this isn't new. 
there's nothing new here. It's just we're going to look at the existing framework, and you can't do it, right? Which is, I think, what the SEC went through several years ago. Um, and I'm not going to go through this in detail, but what I would point out is that where you see strong market growth, you're seeing it where there's government investing on the platforms which has built trust. So go fourth column over, you see it in the UK, a comprehensive program where the government co-invests in the platforms. And in the Netherlands, which again I said punches above its weight. Um, and what we see, I mentioned, is this sort of convergence. You've got this notion at the EU level. Yes, people would argue it's a dysfunctional organization in Europe and Americans. It is not a United States of Europe. But there is an initiative called the Capital Markets Union to essentially harmonize regulation across the EU. And this is marching forward. Okay? Now, there are directives with the EU now that national governments are supposed to comply with. So if you're regulated in one country with certain conditions, in theory, you're supposed to be able to passport into every other 27 European, uh, all 27 European countries. As a practical matter, right? The Germans say, fine, you can do that here from the UK as long as you do it in the way that complies with our national law. So they override at the national level, right? But, you know, it's a little bit like trying to stick your finger in the dike if you're a regulator. Because if you look at the bottom chart, this is our data which shows that 10% of marketplace or peer-to-peer -peer lending last year in Europe actually was cross-border. So I'm an Italian business. By the way, in Italy, one, it, the volume of Italy in peer-to-peer -peer lending is one-tenth of one percent of the UK volume, and they have the same populations and GDPs, basically. It's an extraordinary difference. Now, if I'm an Italian, me, and uh, there's no availability to borrow in Italy, well, I'll do it on a UK platform. I think this, this is increasingly going to happen. And so what's the Italian regulator? and political establishment and policymakers going to do at some point, they're going to realize people are just going to go to London. So that's what's ultimately, I think, going to drive this convergence at the national level. And China moving from unregulated to regulated very slowly. But what's interesting here is this sort of private market solution to tracking and rating websites. So there's almost this private compliance and oversight function that's emerged. So China's a China's a watch this space kind of market. Um, very briefly, this is the London tube in January, okay? And you can go in the London tube anytime. You'd never see this in New York, okay? Ads all over the place for marketplace lending and crowdfunding. And the result, this is Morgan Stanley's data, they said, well, you know, lender awareness is higher in the UK than the US. I mean, I've highlighted people who are aware of it and not use it. I mean, it's 85% bigger in the U.S. market. So this is a very, very kind of known, basically trusted, understood phenomenon. It's not this niche thing a very small percentage of the population have heard of in the U.K. It's, it's, it's broadly, very broad awareness levels. And that manifests itself in borrow behavior, right? So if, if this just seems to be socially acceptable, Right? It's in the tube. I trust the tube. Right? It's funny how people connect things. Um, and this is a big sample. Right? I mean, you're looking here of people who actually could have gotten a loan from a bank. So you know, there's th these are people who chose not to take the loan offer from the bank and borrow here. Very different story than SMEs. Again, our data. Right? It's Un, I think it's unfair to conclude that there's a selection bias problem. Because I think what we're seeing is that these are actually, in many cases, pretty decent companies that just don't fit the credit box. This is where analytics come in, in terms of getting a more comprehensive picture of affordability and intentionality in making a loan. Um, and these are relatively mature businesses. I won't go into too much data. Now, we also did a lot of survey work on motivations. And I think someone made a comment on the panel. You know, this is a, basically an institutional crowd. I think you need to really remember, and this is kind of going back to my social theme here, there's a lot going on here about people who engaged in this that are, it's not just about financial return. 
I would say from interviews we've conducted, people are very concerned, again, as individual uh, funders, uh, protecting capital, don't want to lose principal. But you know, um, they're not necessarily focused on maximizing return here. Um, uh, you know, I look at the first line, for example, right? Uh, right? This is the different types of online alternative finance moving from, you know, peer-to-peer -peer lending. And, you know, very important to important, I feel my money makes a difference is over half of those individuals funding loans. And I think this is easily forgotten by institutional investors that, you know, let's face it, you're in a world where you're driven by returns. Retail investors are not. And it's shifting and it's generational. So when we talk about um, doing social and environmental good, again, you see an interesting spectrum. You would expect that donation crowdfunding is much higher, and it is. But it's far from zero for business lending. Supporting local business. It matters. Not for everybody. And I think if I was a platform, what take away, or actually, or an investor, I would be looking at this and saying, wow, we're putting tons of energy into credit analytics, focused on borrowers. But, you know, there's interesting things going on with investors. And maybe we should pivot and do some psychometric analysis on them. Because I think as it gets more competitive there, differentiation on some of these be potentially important. So you end with, for example, a different funding model. I mean, this is rate setter. Right? This is end of 13, where you see institutional money in that platform is 3%. They specifically are trying to build a business based on an individual investor. Again, reflecting local market characteristics. Fraud problems in China, I won't go into that in detail. But what you see is, because of these problems, see interesting models emerge. For example, um, very interesting in terms of sending huge teams in to geocode photos of everything about the business and talk about the data room online. That's happening. Or Dan Rong, where not only do I use social data along with transaction data and phone data to credit score you, but Social sanctions, uh, if you don't, if you miss a payment, I'll broadcast that to your social network. Um, I had, oh, this missed, didn't map properly. I was going to talk about developing markets. I was going to talk about Credit Tech. Credit Tech in Hamburg, very interesting company. I mean, it doesn't even bother with developed markets. Someone was talking about one-click credit decisions. Credit tech's 35 seconds on average, right? In nine markets, growing very, very quickly and growing very profitably. So again, outside the US market, outside the, outside the Australian market, I have a significant opportunity. So I guess in some what I would say, I, I, you know, we would take a view that this, providing there's a accommodating regulation, this is going to continue to have very strong growth. By accommodating regulation, I think what you're likely to see is, is some funds moving towards what I would call investment managers. So the, the days of being a matching engine, I think, are kind of passe. And I think this is a good, you're going to face a choice as a platform, hybrid bank, or are we a investment manager? And I think John made the point, you're going to see maybe investment management firms get into the space, because I think there's going to be some competitive tension there. Um, there's still a lot we don't know about this market. I tried to highlight that in my comment about um, China. And because there's a lot we don't know, uh, we've scaled what we've done in the UK and Germany, or in the in, um, uh, and we have five very large regional global studies which are kicking off this quarter. Um, Greater China, in partnership with Chunghua University in Beijing, Asia Pacific with the University of Sydney, and with the University of Chicago, we're doing the Americas, the US, Canada, South America, Central America, and the Caribbean. And we'll have masses of data, I would think, by January. So in fact, the Americas study 
launches on October the 15th, and I would really encourage the platforms to contribute by completing the survey. It's anonymized data, it's not transaction level data, but it's very important, particularly if you want to maintain a sensible policy environment, to support the industry by supporting the research. Thank you very much. Thank you.